We do come to the letter of 3 John. This is found on page 1215 in the Bibles in front of you. One of these short, short books of the Bible tucked into the back of your New Testament. And yet there is not a single letter or um, word of the New Testament that is not powerful for salvation and um, we think about the inspiration of the Spirit, um, we remember that all things necessary for life and godliness are given to us in the Word, nothing more and nothing less. Um, if the New Testament did not contain 3 John, we would be missing important things that we would need for our Christian life. Now, as we get going on this, before I even um, just dive into this, let's just remember a couple things about the, the, what we've learned in the previous two letters. So, First John, does anybody remember um, who is the audience of First John? Did he have an addressee? Did he mention people who he, whom he was writing to? Yeah, clearly he's writing to the church, right? He's writing to believers. Did he mention a specific congregation? Exactly. Yeah, there was a church that was um, troubled by um, people who were denying core tenets of the faith, one of which was that Jesus had come in the flesh, that he was the Son of God. Um, and so those um, false teachers had gone out from that church, and so John's addressing that situation, helping them to know what the truth is. Um, all of that's excellent, and, and that's an important point that Mike's making, that First John is written into a very specific context right? Um, the point I'm, I'm actually making is slightly different. Just if you look at the beginning of 1 John, I'm sorry I wasn't very clear on the question, you just notice that there's no like mention of, of any specific congregation or church, although J Mike is definitely right. Um, he has particular people in mind. Then as you look at the beginning of 2 John, it says the elder to the elect lady and her children. We talked about how very likely that's sort of a a coded way of talking about him writing to a particular church. That's the lady. Her children are the members of that church, right? So there's there's First John, which is general, Second John, which is to a particular church, and now look at Third John, to an individual, the elder to the beloved Gaius, right? So um, just a reminder of how the New Testament um, it's written to specific context, but it has these different. Um, specific audiences. Um, so let's look now at the letter of 3 John. And I'm just going to read it all at once, and then we're going to step through it and, um, and uh, process each section together. So 3 John, the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. For I rejoiced greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. For they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. 
I had much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends, each by name. All right, now, before we step into some of the details of the letter, I want to ask, what, what can you tell, just from the first pass here, what can you tell about the situation that John is writing into? What, what's the kind of the, the impetus? Like, he's clearly coming, he's going to see them soon, he's got lots to say, but there's something that's like, i got to write this letter now. <laughs> what's the concern? Good. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Diotrephes, verse 9, is teaching a lie and, and also actively working against um, uh, the truth by refusing to welcome these traveling Christians or these brothers, right? And not only that, right? Verse 10, he's even stopping those who would want to do that and putting them out of the church. Wow, you know, like... Um, to some extent, it's seeming like excommunication here, if you're going to, or at least social um, shunning of some kind, um, if you're trying to extend hospitality to the, tra to the traveling brothers. So, so this issue of showing hospitality um, is something that we've already seen just very recently. I want to remind you of this in Second John. Look, to, look in Second John, just the other side of the page, um, verse ten. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Okay, so this is instruction about when not to show hospitality, right? We talked about that last time. Um, and, and so let's just remind ourselves, why does this issue matter? Why does it matter so much whom you show hospitality to or whom you don't show hospitality to. Yeah, Doug? They can validate um, <clears throat> what they're doing. Or seemingly validate the other that you have said. Good. Yeah. So it would be, you know, peace fellowship with people or even minimally let them into our house. Then they can persuade uh, others. Right. Good. So um, it conveys acceptance of their teaching. And um, you notice the heading I put up here is um, hospitality to teachers. So we're, we're not talking about like hospitality in a general sense. And um, also when we talk about hospitality, we're not... Sometimes in America or, you know, just in English now, you, you hear that word and you think of like dinner parties, right? Or, um, hey, we're going to show some hospitality, have, have friends over, have a pleasant meal. Not what we're talking about, right? This is talking about people who are traveling from place to place, teaching the word, and like they're, they're not like hotels, right? Um, or the inns that are in existence are sketchy. And so what do they need? They need just a place to stay. They need a roof over their heads. They need food for the journey, right? And Doug's making a great point. Um, when you welcome teachers in, you are conveying acceptance of their teaching. So very, very important then. Who are you endorsing by supporting in this way, right? What else? What are some other reasons why showing hospitality or not showing hospitality to teachers matters? Even just from what we read, or from Second John, the larger considerations. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there's like, um, you know, in this situation, there's like power issues involved with um, with diatrophies of. Whose authority, really, are you going to recognize? Diotrephes? I mean, part of what John's doing here, right, is he's setting up an either-or decision, right? 
either you're going to do what Diotrephes says or you're going to do what I say, right? Good. Yeah, and um, any other thoughts as to, like, why it matters whether you show hospitality to a traveling teacher or not? Oh, sorry, Todd, yeah, I didn't see your hand. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah, taking part in their works. So it's not just I endorse this, right? Um, you're enabling their works. Whether it's evil which would be um, 2 John 11, or, did you notice this? Verse 8 of our letter. Therefore we ought to support people like these that we may be fellow workers for the truth. Okay, so um, it, it cuts both ways. And when you are showing hospitality, you are actually becoming a fellow worker of the truth. We're going to hopefully return to that because there's a lot there. Um, I'll just remind you of a couple other things just from broader considerations. Just turn back with me um, to Matthew. And this is just a basic dynamic of how things work in Jesus' kingdom. Of course, Jesus did a lot of teaching himself, right? But he also commissions teachers, right? And so if you look at Matthew 10... Here's where he is commissioning his disciples to be teachers, right? And there's a lot at stake in whether people are going to receive the people Jesus sends out. And he says, um, chapter 10, Matthew 10, verse 11, whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. And then one more text, and we'll reflect on what we're hearing here. Matthew 25, verse 40. This is Jesus um, talking about the sheep and the goats and um, talking about um, the sheep who welcomed and received people. And the king, verse 40 here, Matthew 25, verse 40 says, the king will answer them when they're asking, hey, when did we ever do all this? He says, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. So as we're thinking about Jesus, the king of all, Sending out his messengers. What's at stake when a true messenger comes to the door of a disciple? Yeah, you're entertaining Christ, or if you fail to, you're turning him away, right? Um, there's, there's, this is the divine king of the universe, right? Sending his guys out. And so those who are truly sent by him have his authority. They have his, um, his stamp on them, right? And to turn them away then is to bring judgment. Um, you know, second, uh, Matthew 10, verse 15, it'll be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on that day. So acceptance of teaching and, um, you know, whose authority, right, even the acceptance and the authority of Christ himself is at stake here. And so this is why there are so many instructions in the New Testament about receiving people. I'm just going to read a couple of them real quick to you. Um, Romans 12, 13, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Hebrews 13, 2, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares, or it could be messengers. The word for angel and messenger is the same. Um, 
1 Peter 4, 9, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. 1 Corinthians 16, let me just read this one, because this is another text like this. 1 Corinthians 16, 10 through 11. When Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he's doing the work of the Lord. You hear that? Put Timothy at ease among you, because he's doing the work of the Lord, as I am. So let no one despise him. Help him on his way in peace, that he may return to me, for I am expecting him with the brothers. So there's a clear identification. Timothy, doing the work of the Lord, <laughs> receive him, send him on his way. And Paul says in other letters, you know, Romans uh, chapter 1, I hope that you'll receive me and send me on my way as I hope to go to Spain. Um, this is critical, a critical work of the church. Um, and we're going to reflect on, okay, so what does this mean for our time? But I'm just trying to give you a sense of the stakes as now we dive a little more closely into the letter and some of the issues at stake in it. And let's just look at the opening, opening words, verses 1 through 4. Um, you're, the ESV kind of shows you the structure of the letter, right? Um, 1 through 4 is obviously the intro. 5 through 12 is the body of the letter. 13 through 15 is the closing words. So look at the intro. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. For I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. What do you think are some of the most important things John's trying to say in these opening four verses? What are, what are sort of like the key ideas that Gaius really should, should get and that we need to get? as we read those opening four words, or four, four verses. Say again? Good, yeah, so truth is a key word, right? I'm trying to remember how many times it comes up. Uh, whom I love in truth, verse one. Um, then verse three, they came in, these brothers, he's, he's talking about these brothers who has come to him, and uh, to John, that is, and testified to your truth. What do you think the use of the word truth is there? They testified to your truth truth. Yeah, Doug? Yeah, his sticking to the proper teaching of the gospel, that's at least one piece of it. What else? Especially as you think about the next part, you know, as you're walking in the truth, they testify to your truth as you're walking in the truth. What's that? What, what use of the word truth do we have there? Yeah, and I think, I think you're, you know, you're you're centering on like um, kind of the ideas or the, the fact that he's, um, he's holding fast to those truths and propagating them. That's clearly um, a key part of this. Uh, part of why I'm still asking for more is um, what he says in the second part where he says, you know, as indeed you are walking in the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so like there's all kinds of like life choices that go into walking in the truth, right? So when he says they testified to your truth, um, I'm reading that kind of as a synonym in this case for faithfulness, um, like a life, um, a life path that is true. Like we talk about, um, you know, so-and-so, he was true to me. He, he, you know, he was faithful to his promise. Um, Gaius is being true in that deep sense of the word. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and and he's he's got this good reputation, right? The, the 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 brothers who have come to John are testifying about him, saying, "Look, this guy is living it." Right. Good. What are some other things that we want to make sure we take away from these first four verses? What are, what are some things that John really wants Gaius to hear? Yeah. Well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, there are health and wealth um, preachers. Yeah, exactly. Who will lift out verse two out of context. Um, 
And you know, I pray it all may go well with you and you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. Um, and just sort of say, this is God's like guarantee that if you're really walking with him, you're gonna be healthy. Um, obviously the broader context of the scriptures completely debunks that. But what is being said then by verse two? It's not that, right? <laughs> it's not what you meant. Um, what is verse two saying? Good. Yeah, as it goes well for your soul, that's clearly one of his burdens. Yeah, that, that deeper sense of wellness, no matter what happens, um, that you would it would be well with your soul. Um, and I think we could say, you know, that he is concerned for just his bodily health too, right? Um, he does care about, I'm hoping things go well with you and your health. Like the word really is like, um, just the word for bodily health, right? So, yeah, Aaron. Yeah, right. That's right. He, we know what's most important, right, is his soul. But he prays for his, his good health, too, um, in his body. Yeah. So it's intriguing to me that this letter is not written to Diotrephes, it's written to Gaius. Right. Especially if Gaius is throwing people out of church, Diotrephes is throwing people out of church. This is a situation with like a rogue elder, a rogue mm -hmm. and John is actually writing to another church leader to encourage him, mm -hmm. to let him know air support's coming. <laughs> yeah. And knowing that that can be such a stressful thing, he says, I pray that you get good health. So yeah. Yeah. So, so really interesting. As we're trying to put the pieces together, it's such a short letter, right? So it's hard to know exactly the situation. But if Gaius is one of the other leaders of this church, and he's dealing with Diotrephes, who's you know apparently, if anything, a rogue leader in the church, one possibility is that Diotrephes is the guy who's the well-to-do guy who has the, the space in his house to host the church. The, remember, a lot of the churches are host, hosted in people's homes. When it says he's throwing people out one possibility is that Diotrephes is just saying, you can't come in here anymore to the people who aren't doing what he wants, right? Whatever the exact circumstances, um, Pastor Montgomery's pointing out that like, for Gaius to be walking in the truth when Diotrephes is doing all this stuff is gonna be very stressful, wearing not just on his, on his soul, but on his body as well, right? And, and what he's saying, what, what John is saying to Gaius is, hey, support is coming. Um, Hang in there. I'm praying it all continues well for you. And, and what is he saying, you know, in verse 4? I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. How does, how does that um, fill out these opening ideas here? Yeah. Yeah, good. Right. Right. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So, I mean, as we're thinking about the word children, obviously, literally, it could mean biological children. But that's not not very likely to be um, the use of the word here. He says, "My children are walking the truth." We're probably thinking along the lines of like Titus one four where Paul says to Titus, my true child in a common faith. What's he saying? He's saying Titus is the one whom I have begotten in the Lord, who came to faith through my ministry, right? And now Paul is a spiritual father to him. And so similarly, Gaius apparently came to know Christ through John. And what John's saying is it's just, it's so awesome to hear that you're continuing in the faith that I imparted to you at the, at the beginning. Were you gonna add something there, Anna? Yeah, yeah. That's at least one possible uh, interpretation. It seems very natural there. Yeah, Doug. Can you give us an application of your personal life as a pastor? Because we're not pastors. Mm, yeah. How you would read Christ on this verse, shepherding us 
Yeah, great, great question. And I think, you know, what John is saying here is so useful, not just to pastors, but I would say anybody who has spiritual oversight of people, which includes parents, right? Um, This can be read very literally. You know, we can reword this for ourselves as parents, right? What is our greatest joy for our kids that they're walking in the truth? You know, are they struggling in health? Are they struggling with, you know, just work? and money problems? Um, Do they have all kinds of life circumstances that are really bad and things you would never want for your kids, but are they still walking in the truth? Then we rejoice, right? And I know it's true for Pastor Montgomery and myself and all the elders that like nothing makes us happier than to see people embracing the truth, loving the truth. Um, I'll I'll never forget... um, one of my uh, profs at Westminster, who is a counseling prof, he just described like whenever he sees repentance in his office, talking with people, like true repentance, where somebody is like owning their sin for the first time and realizing, I need to change, I need Jesus. He just says, you know, you just want to take off your shoes and just worship because you're on holy ground, right? Because it's just like, wow, this is the spirit. Right, and you get to have a front row seat to the Spirit's work. There's no greater joy than that. Um, that's what Jesus is doing in this present age. So, yeah, that's beautiful. Good. So he's he's rejoicing in Gaius's faithfulness. He says, "Brother, you are much loved. I I love you so much." Did you notice how many times the word "love" comes up? Beloved Gaius, I love in the truth. Beloved. He he's just emphasizing how much he loves this dear brother. And he's saying, I want to see you continuing in the truth. Indeed, there's nothing greater to me than seeing you walking in the truth, even in in a time of suffering. And now he's going to launch into the body of the letter. And let's look at uh, verses 5 through 8. Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testified to your love before the church. And actually, let's just stop right there. Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testified to your love before the church. Can anybody put together the narrative that goes behind those words? What has happened? Anybody, anybody, like, do the detective work? Yeah. Exactly. So here's Gaius. Here's these guys who have come to Gaius. He doesn't know who these people are, but he showed them hospitality, right? Helped them on their way. And where did those brothers go next? To go teach other believers, specifically with whom? With John, right? Because he's now writing, saying, I'm so glad for the testimony that these guys have brought to me. So you imagine, here are these, these guys, guys has never met. They come and they're, they're, they're true believers. They're really from Christ. Gaius recognizes them, gives them a place, gives them support, sends them on their way. They go on and they meet John. They say, hey, you know what happened to us when we came to Gaius's place? This is how he supported and encouraged us. Right, And so they're giving this testimony. And look verse, back at verse 3. I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth. Right, So these are the same brothers, as he's talking about in verse 5, who were strangers to Gaius, but he still loved them on their way. And so then they went on and told John about what happened. Okay, and now let's look in the second half of verse 6. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. For they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. So what what are these verses saying? What's the principle he's laying out? Go ahead. Yeah, Todd. Out and said, 
Exactly. Good. Yeah, they've accepted nothing, and it says accepted nothing from the Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles in this context? Non-believers, excellent. And that's a striking way of referring to non-believers, right? Because what did the Gentiles mean before Jesus came? Well, it was everybody who wasn't a Jew, right? So there was the, the true people of God, the children of Abraham, right? The, the 12 tribes, those are the, the people of God. God marked them as his own, right? And then what happens when Jesus comes? A very amazing thing happens, right? Paul says, I am now a minister to the Gentiles. And he says, Galatians 3, that um, the, the true Jew is now the one who has the faith of Abraham. Now it's actually Romans 4. Um, but then Galatians 3 says, um, let me just read it because it's so striking and so important for this context here. Um, he says that if you, if you want to know who the true children of Abraham are, um, it's those who are in Christ, Galatians 3.29. If you are Christ's, in other words, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise, even if you're an uncircumcised Gentile, right? And so the word Israel goes through this major change where what, who is the true Israel now? Well, it's the people... It's the people of God, Jew and Gentile, who have faith in Christ. Who is now the Gentile? No longer just the person who's uncircumcised and a non-Jew, but now the person who's outside of the true Israel, the unbeliever. And there's other places where we see this, uh, you know, Second Peter, or sorry, First Peter, um, chapter 2, multiple times. Um, uh, verse 12, for example, says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. He's not talking about non-Jews, he's talking about non-Christians. Okay, so they have received, these guys, these traveling teachers have received nothing from the Gentiles, the non-Christians. So what does that mean for us in terms of the responsibility to support the missionaries, the traveling teachers? Obviously, like we just said, right? It's up to us, right? It's up to the people of God to do this. So Paul, uh, John is laying out this principle. You're doing well when you send people like this on their way. Why? Because these are people who aren't going to get support anywhere else except the church, right? And if there's going to be support, it's going to have to come from the people of God. And what's going to be the result if you do this? End of verse 8, we may be fellow workers for the truth. And this is such a, just a refreshing word. Um, in our present, present age, there's so much of what's called pietism. This has been around for a long time. But it's the, basically the idea that it's a, it's a low view of vocation. And it's the idea that if you're a really serious Christian, you'd either be a pastor or a missionary. You'd be in full-time Christian service, Right? What is John saying about that? <laughs> we are all in service, full-time Christian service. And just like a body has different parts, right? There's the, the mouth and the eye and the hands and whatnot. Um, there are going to be different ways in which that service is expressed, right? So um, just to, again, just so we really get this, how does he dignify Gaius's hospitality? Yeah, buddy. Great. Yes, he cares about what we do with our money very much. Yes. Yeah, and that our, our stewardship of our wealth and of our homes, just think about our homes, um, is, is a sacred thing, right? That's a sacred thing that has been entrusted to us. Excellent. Yeah, and so just one more time, how does he dignify Gaius' hospitality? Yeah. He says by providing hospitality and support to these missionaries, you become a fellow worker. Yes. You become a fellow worker in that mission. I was just thinking about this yesterday. Um, I'm part of this homeschool soccer league, and it was just striking me when I saw one of my players score a goal. And I told the whole team this. I said, you know, this, this little girl, she just scored this goal, but you realize you all scored this goal, 
right? She could not have done that if the defense wasn't passing the ball up and the midfielders weren't doing their job. Like, it is the entire team. Now, there's one person who gets the credit. They scored the goal and all of that, right? But it's the entire team working together that causes that successful result. You are fellow workers for the truth when you are supporting people like these. Let's just pause just for a moment here. You know, we're doing observation, interpretation, application. What, what, how does this, how should this um, encourage us in our labors here in 21st century America, Covenant Presbyterian Church? What are some applications we need to take from this? Yeah, Doug? Yeah, exactly right. Prayer, financial support for, for missionaries and for, for the, those who minister the gospel. Um, that's a huge, huge way in which we honor Christ. And, um, and so that's, that's really important. Good. What are some other, other things? Yeah, Aaron? Good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Exactly, yeah. By, by failing to do this kind of support, we're indirectly supporting those who teach falsehood. And I would also encourage us, too, just thinking about, you know, the very kind of down-to-earth kind of hospitality Gaius was showing here, um, even just the way in which we care for our missionaries when they're back from the field, the way in which we extend concrete expressions of love to them, uh, making them feel at home, making them feel welcome, making them feel supported. Um, that's an important act of the church. Um, a lot of times when people come back, even it's usually just for a couple months or something, um, it's just a brief window, right? Um, and it's their, their one chance to kind of connect with the local body that's sending them. Um, we need to do all that we can to make them feel uh, like it's almost like we have to compress uh, 12 months of love into those one or two months, right? Uh, we want to really sh show them, hey, we are with you and supporting you. And let's look at the opposite now with Diotrephes, verse 9. I've written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I'll bring up what he's doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. And I'm going to read verse 11 too. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Okay, so what's his burden here? What's, what's kind of the big idea in verses 9 through 11? Yeah, Mike? Okay. I want to ask, um, we have one elder that uh, believes that Jesus is Christ and the Son of God. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Okay. Right. So, should we believe that this man is sowing the seed of Jesus Christ or is this coming from? Yeah, great question. Like, what what's going on with Diotrephes? Was he somebody who was also like those other guys from First John who were teaching falsehood, um, like that Jesus wasn't the Son of God and um, that he didn't come in the flesh? It's a great question. And, you know, if these three letters are in some way describing the same situation, you know, uh, or are some way bound together. Um, there's something, de there's definitely a strong possibility of what you're suggesting, but I, I'm not sure that we can really say, um, because really, John, the only thing he really brings up here is these particular, this particular sin of Diotrephes of refusing hospitality. And of course, there's other things that surround that, but he just doesn't bring up like what he's teaching. Right? He doesn't bring up what he, what he believes. Um, but, but he does say some other things about di diatrophies. Yeah. Yeah. yeah kind of that. He tells us one very important thing about diatrophies. He likes to put himself first and therefore doesn't acknowledge God's authority. Yeah. What a striking statement, right? 
Yeah, like verse 9, Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first. What is going on with that? Pride. What? Yeah, pride. Yeah, exactly. And, and that idea, um, it's a particular species of pride, right? Like what, what is Diotrephes in the, you know, the grievous sickness of his soul? What does he, what does he want? Go ahead. It sounds to me, it reminds me of the places where Paul talked about the challenge to his own responsibility. Mm, yeah. Here you have Diotrephes possibly challenging John's authority. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's he's speaking wickedly against us and thinks he's going to John and yep. the truth. But I think that's essentially so not acknowledging authority, kind of speaking wickedly against John. Mm-hmm. I think he's again perhaps saying like, listen to me, not them. Yeah. And I'm reading that differently. No, I I don't think so. I think uh, when you say he's He's wanting basically John's place as apostle type authority. Um, it's a great connection. And I thought about this, but you know, Second Corinthians, when Paul is dealing with the super apostles, as he calls them, um, you know, uh, it's the same dynamic of they're, they're jealous of that authority that God has given to Paul or John, and they're trying to supplant them. They're trying to say, no, actually listen to me, right? Um, and this is where we just have to remember, like John, he's in a completely different place. Same thing with P, uh, Paul, right? Um, how, how are they not guilty of liking to put themselves first? How are they, how is their situation different from Diotrephes? Like when John says at the end of verse 12, you know that our testimony is true. What? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it happened to Moses too. That's right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, so it's not just the origin of the authority, which is a key piece you're bringing out. Like, Jesus actually commissioned John and Paul and all the other apostles. He divinely said, this is your role and your calling. And that goes even all the way back to 1 John 1, what we have seen, what we have um, t- you know, uh, touched, and all of the, the hands-on personal contact that the apostles had with, with Christ. Um, so Jesus appointed, that's a key difference, but even the way they exercise their authority is different, right? So John and the other apostles, they're glad to welcome and to recognize and to celebrate others who are uh, furthering the gospel, right? Um, and even Jesus himself, when the disciples come up and say, hey, all these other people are, are you know, preaching and um, they're not with us. And Jesus says, if they're not, with the, they're not um, against us, they're for us, right? The, there's this willingness to recognize, you know, even as um, strikingly, Paul will say in Philippians 1, um, even if they're trying to tear me down <laughs> by their preaching, if they're preaching Christ, I'm satisfied, right? So the, the mode of how they're exercising their authority, where it's just, we want Christ exalted, um, that's, that's what matters most to the true apostles, whereas for Diotrephes, it's just all about his power and um, wanting to be first. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. Peril. Yeah. Yeah, who are we living in front of, right? Yeah, this is going to be a big theme in our sermon today. Um, 
whose praise is this really all, who is, it, who is this really all about, right? Um, and that's all tucked into Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first and therefore does not acknowledge our authority. Yeah, Doug? Uh, it seems that... <clears throat> Apparently not, although, as Mike's suggesting, it's certainly possible. I, I think, yeah, but we just don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, some warning Now let's uh, let's actually dive into that just a little bit more. What is the status of Diotrephes according to John? And I, I do want to get your hand there, Anna, in a moment. Um, look at what he says about Diotrephes. Look look closely. Diotrephes likes to put himself first. He does not acknowledge our authority. And then. John saying, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to come, I'll bring up what he's doing, all this wicked nonsense, and then how he's not just stopping, uh, he's not just, you know, not welcoming the brothers who come, which is a serious sin, but also refusing, um, you know, putting out others who are doing so. But then look what he said, this is part of why I read verse 11 along. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever is, does good is from God, whoever does evil has not seen God. Um, whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. What is, what is he saying about Diotrephes? What is Diotrephes' status according to John? Is Diotrephes a Christian who's got some struggles, or is it something else? Okay. Yeah, so non-Christian involved with wickedness. Simone, were you going to add? Yeah, yeah, and that he's evil, right? Um, he says in um, verse 11, do not imitate evil. In context, this isn't just some general principle, right? Do not imitate evil. In other words, don't, die, don't imitate diatrophies in what he's doing, this, this self-absorbed refusal to help those who are on their way. Um, but imitate good. And then he makes the even more stark point that I appreciate Judy, you're bringing this out, that um, he's not seeing God. Yeah. But, but he's self-deceived. This is, this is a man who obviously has some influence in the church, but he would never, he's not perceiving that about him. That's right. Very deadly situation. Yeah, and just remember all that we learned back in 1 John. Um, you know, Montgomery's bringing out like the self-deception here. One of the purposes of 1 John is to undeceive us about what does it mean to be a true disciple can you say that you love God and not love your neighbor at the same time? No. <laughs> Remember that from 1 John, 1 John 3? You can't say, I, I am a follower of Jesus, and then when there's this clear um, you know, responsibility uh, to further the, the brothers on their way, um, we're not doing that. Okay, that calls into question now our status here. Um, yeah. At least at the moment, that's right. You have an excellent point that he is a part of the church at this time. That's right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Excellent. Yeah, so um, regardless of where he's actually at, his official standing is clearly not just in the church, but in some kind of leadership capacity here. Yeah, Doug? Right. Well, th that's where I am trying to press. Yeah, no, I appreciate you pressing me on this. Like, is it just that he's um, a Christian who's struggling with sin, or is is John saying he's not? He doesn't actually know the Lord. I think I, the point I'm that's decisive for me anyway, um, and I appreciate you you pressing on this. 
is, is verse 11, where he says, whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. So it seems like he's saying, like, when you're, when you're at this level of, like, stubborn, unrepentant sin, there's a clear burden from the Lord, send on, my, on their way the true messengers, right? And you're refusing to do that. You're refusing to honor the clear command of Christ. And beyond that, you're, like, kicking out people who are refusing, right? John, I think, is doing what the New Testament instructs us elsewhere, um, to just call that out for what it is and saying, okay, sorry, this now undermines your testimony. You can no longer, you can no longer claim to be a true follower of Christ anymore. The so. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. When he says, I'm going to bring this up when I come, what, what is the process going to look like? And even like, what was church government, how did it function in the days of the apostles where we have the special office of apostle um, before we kind of move on to the kind of the regular days of the church before the foundational or after the foundational era? Um, great questions. And I think there is some room for, for difference of opinion here. But I do think that John wants to be as stark as he can be in his language and saying, guys, this is an either or thing. Either you're going to honor Diotrephes or you're going to honor, honor the Lord Jesus. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, the, it's the kind of like forthrightness that we need. Yeah. He doesn't believe. And today, Christian leaders want to refuse. Yeah. I'm not being a Christian in a loving and Christian manner. Right, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's like the, that kind of false uh, idea of love. Like, if I'm truly love, I'm always going to be nice to everybody. Well, no, um, that's not true love when um, there's serious sin at stake. And I know there's a null of hands up. I want to well, love to continue the conversation, but because we only have a couple minutes left, I want to drive home what I think is the core application burden of this letter, which is the issue of... Hospitality. Yes, you know, diatrophies is this issue and everything. But look even at verse 12. We didn't get to this, but Demetrius has received a good testimony. Here's a new guy, Demetrius, a different person. From everyone and from the truth itself, we also add our testimony. And you know that our testimony is true. Guess who's probably carrying the letter? Demetrius. And what's, what's going on right now? Gaius has a very big decision to make. He has the decision of, will I honor the teaching of um, John and of the Lord Jesus and welcome Demetrius into my home, which could mean that Diotrephes gets really mad and kicks me out of the church? Or will I just say, sorry, Demetrius, can't stay here tonight? And just to put this in uh, modern terms, uh, I found this in a commentary. I thought this was really good. Can you imagine your doorbell ringing late one evening and there stands a stranger with a note in his or her hand, allegedly from a mutual acquaintance, asking you to take the person in for a stay? Can you imagine that? That's the situation that Gaius is in as he receives this letter. Now, we granted don't have that situation often in our present context, but I think that we have a lot of opportunities to show this kind of love. Um, to, to honor those who are coming to us in the name of the Lord Jesus, um, to, to be disposed, to serve those who are in need, um, who have a legitimate need. And of course, there's work that we have to do to figure that out. But um, wanting to be generous, even when it puts ourselves at some risk, right? Um, we need to protect our families and all that good stuff. But we also need to not be so self-protective um, that, we, that we fail to love those whom Jesus would have us love. Wish we could talk more. We've come to the end of our time. Really appreciate the discussion we've been able to have together as we've gone through these letters. It's really just been such a joy, I know, for myself and Pastor Montgomery. Um, thank you for your participation and just your entering into the Word of God with us. So let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for the challenge of this letter. What a striking, striking um, challenge it must have been to Gaius to receive this letter. And Lord, um, 
we pray that we, when we are put in a similar, similar place of challenge, that we would go the way of integrity, that we would continue to walk in the truth and to make the costly decisions that, it, that are involved in walking in the truth. And that we do so because of the gospel, because of Jesus who has given up everything for us. Lord, help us. Help us to be people of genuine love. Um, when we are confronted with um, false uh, and wrong understandings of the faith, Lord, help us um, not to play around with that, um, but to recognize sin for what it is. And we pray, Father, that you would give us courage as Christians, that we would really support one another, um, even when it's costly. And that this church, Lord, that you continue to make us to be known as a church who is uh, faithful and sending beloved brothers and sisters in Christ on their way as they're serving you. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.